topic for today is scientific integrity, where we've before talked about what characterizes good science versus bad science. We've talked about paradigmatic disagreements about norms and how science is supposed to unfold. Here today, a clear ethical perspective enters the picture. We want to get an understanding of what we call scientific misconduct, so cheating or dishonesty. Um, and we'll get some examples that illustrate what this is, but also the definition and understanding of how to identify whether something is actual misconduct or just disagreement, bad science, etc. So it's really important to distinguish between these phenomena. We're not looking at false research or incompetent research. There's plenty of that, but that's not the interest when we are discussing scientific dishonesty. This is about misconduct. In Danish, we say there's a clear ethical component to this. Um, and then scientific dishonesty is sort of the strong concept where something is really wrong and questionable research practices might be more of a gray area. Um, and let's get a few examples to get a sense of what, what, what I mean. And you might know some of these examples. Um, first, but first, let's reflect. We've seen this Carney 2016 text, and you can also just stop the video and reflect on if you think this constitutes scientific dishonesty. I'll get back to this example in, in, the, in the live session. But she explained in her 2016 document what they did and, and why she did it. it was wrong. So it, it was clearly wrong, it was false research, but was it actually dishonest? Let's get back to that example. Um, we have another example by someone called Brian Wansink, who is known for research about the sizes of bowls that you serve food in or the sizes of packages. And you might also have heard about some of the signs that it seems to be the case that if you serve food in smaller cups or plates, people end up eating less. They don't just sort of then take, uh, fill up the plate twice. They just simply, they, they do seem to end up eating less. That's at least what this research shows. But let's look at an email that Brian Wansing sent in 2012 to some of his collaborators. And he says here, one sticking point seems that blah, blah, so 71%, that was apparently fine, but the p-value was 0 .06, 0 0.06. It seems to me it should be lower. And then he's asking these, these research assistants, do you want to take a look at it and see what you think? If you can get the data and it needs some tweaking, it would be good to get that one value below 0 0.05, which is the traditional cutoff point for being able to publish a study. Seems to me it should be lower. It needs some tweaking. Let's get back to, again, later on, if we if we think this constitutes dishonesty. And also here, the pain, the one who actually got the email, talked about how he ran 400 strategic mediation analysis on the same data set in order to find something. He didn't find anything in any of these analyses. But, but again, um, is this sort of proper science of really digging for a pattern to this extreme degree? Certainly incompetent. The question is, would we also call it dishonest? Brian Wansink insists that it was not. So just to emphasize again, science can be poor for a lot of reasons, it can be incompetent, irrelevant data sets, wrong research design, etc. We're just interested in the cheating element and we are looking at methods and norms, not whether anything is true or not. Something that is dishonest can in principle be true and something that is false can um, can can be on, uh, an honest piece of work. So it's dishonesty or this legal expression of gross negligence, um, called for some for some little in Danish. This is what we're looking for here, um, and also as emphasized by official Danish guidelines for scientific dishonesty, the committees on this these this dishonesty shall not be entitled to consider cases involving the validity or truth of scientific theories or cases involving the research quality of a scientific product. So it's not about truth, validity, or the quality. It's solely about how the research was done um, and whether there was any kind of dishonesty or gross negligent behavior in place, according to the Danish rules. Um, <clears throat> I see. And, and here there is a case you might have heard of, although it's, it's a couple of years old, Milena Pinkova that we see in the picture here. Um, she was doing research on, on the brain and, and, and involved rats and, and doing various kinds of experiments on rats. And it turned out that she had fabricated data, she had cheated with funding sources. So 
she claimed to have done research on 3,000 rats that she bought from some company in Spain, which turned out not to exist. It was a very long, complicated process of investigation. It took nine years. Um, in the end, she was also reported to the police for document forgery, quitted because the case was too old. But, I mean, this is a case where it's clear-cut fabrication, cheating, dishonesty, and, and there was not really any doubt about um, uh, about this this case. I mean, if you ask her, the case is different. But I just want to highlight one small element from this, which doesn't really relate to the science, but it just illustrates the extreme nature of this case. So Pinkawa was late with a letter she had to send. And she then explained, I've been unable to send it because of an unfortunate incident in my family. Wednesday, the 14th of May, my mother and sister died in a car crash in Belgium. That was a lie. They did not die in that car crash. Just absolutely um, tragic and ridiculous to make up such a lie uh, in order to make an excuse for not uh, handing stuff in back in time. But I think it just illustrates the extreme nature of this Pinkova case. Information is from the Danish Wikipedia page on, on Pinkova. Another example that is also clear cut, which is a Dutch psychologist, social psychologist called Staple. And um, you can, I'm not going to read the entire thing here. You can pause the video if you want to sort of get the further details. But basically, Staple acknowledged that he had fabricated his own data sets um, uh, in order to achieve the results that he got. He was extremely well published. And it, it took a few years. It actually took a couple of PhD students noticing there was something in two different data sets that was just too odd. They were basically rows and rows of, of data in two different data sets that were just completely identical, even though they were answering different questions. So imagine one Likert scale-based question and another one, and then the order of answers, three, four, five, seven, two, et cetera, in, every, in all the rows on this Likert scale from one to seven, and they turned out to be identical. That was sort of the, 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 the tipping point, the proof that was needed for uh, the relevant people involved to realize that he had fabricated. And he, he acknowledged it. But he said it was actually driven by ambition. Um, I'm sorry, that it was not, I mean, it was driven by ambition, but it was more complicated, as he said. He loved social psychology. He was really a true, strong believer in the findings that he got to, but he'd been frustrated by the messiness of experimental data, which rarely led to clear conclusions. So I think this is also, again, nicely illustrates Ashwanton's point about science being complicated, being really, really difficult. This is what he was frustrated about. He couldn't easily get the results he wanted, so he cheated another clear-cut example but we can also think of some examples that are sort of less clear and less clear-cut so let's see what um, our friend Dan O'Reilly he has to say about a situation that he was in one so let's listen to what he has to say for a couple of minutes a few years ago I was running some of my own experiments in the lab and when we run experiments we usually hope that one group will behave differently than another so we had one group that I hoped their performance would be very high, another group that I thought the performance would be very low, and when I got the results, that's what we got. I was very happy. Aside from one person, there was one person in the group that was supposed to have very high performance that was actually performing terribly, and he pulled the whole mean down, destroying my statistical significance of the test. So I looked carefully at this guy. He was 20-some years older than anybody else in the sample, and I remember that the drunken guy, all the drunken guy, came one day to the lab wanting to make some easy cash, and this was the guy. Fantastic, I thought, let's throw him out. Who would ever include the drunken guy in the sample? But a couple of days later, we, we thought about it with my students, and we said, what would have happened if this drunken guy was not in that condition? What would have happened if he was in the other group? Would we have thrown him out then? We probably wouldn't have looked at the data at all, and if we did look at the data, we probably said, fantastic, what a smart guy who is performing this low, because he would have pulled the mean of the group lower, giving us even stronger statistical result that we could. So we decided not to throw the guy out and to rerun the experiment. But you know, these, these stories and lots of other experiments that we've done on, on conflicts of interest uh, basically kind of bring two points to the foreground for me. The first one is that in life we encounter many people who you know, in some way or another, try to tattoo our faces, right? They just have the incentives that get them to be blinded to reality and give us advice that is inherently biased. And I'm sure it's something that we all recognize and we see that it happens. Maybe not, we don't recognize every time, but we understand that it happens. The most difficult thing, of course, is to recognize that sometimes we too are blinded by our own 
incentives. And that's a much, much more difficult lesson to take into account because we don't see how conflicts of interest work on us. When I was doing these experiments, I was, in my mind, I was helping science, right? I was eliminating the data to get the true pattern of the data to shine through. I wasn't doing something bad. In my mind, I was actually, you know, a knight trying to help science move along. But this was not the case. I was actually interfering with the process with lots of good intentions. And I think the real challenge is to figure out where are the cases in our lives where conflicts of interest work on us and try not to trust our own intuition to overcome it, but to try to do things that prevent us from falling prey to these behaviors because we can create lots of undesirable circumstances. So, again, this was then an example of a more ambiguous case, which Dan O'Reilly talked about here in this video, and I think it really very nicely illustrates the challenge of this. So, as he said here, there was an outlier that just illustrated a random outlier. This is not his actual data set. But here there was an outlier that just sort of ruined the statistical significance. And he noticed it because it was going in sort of the opposite direction from what it was expected. So if the outlier had sort of been in the, in the, in the right direction, as he said, he probably wouldn't even have looked at the data. He wouldn't have thought about it. So a very good example of how cognitive biases and, and, and the biases we as human beings risk falling prey to, also a phrase from the Schwanten text, and almost the same phrase he just used. We need to be aware of that. Here's a very good example where we would only look at the data if it didn't fit our preconception. If it had fitted our preconception, we wouldn't have noticed it and we wouldn't have thrown out the drunken guy. And so that, that again, this really nicely illustrates a fundamental challenge that we have here in science about being aware of our own biases. It's a great thing to look critically at your data, but remember not just to look critically at the data that doesn't seem to be the way it should be, but also look critically at data that, that does fit your preconception. And the best thing one can do, of course, is just to be, try to be aware of these biases, but also be transparent. How did you look at outliers? Which one did you check out? And why did you remove whatever outliers you had? And if you then just honest about it, well, then, then there was no misconduct. That's really the key thing. And we'll get back to that quite a few times. Um, that's also why it's called scientific dishonesty. If you're honest, then it doesn't seem to fit that category, right? Also, just want to make a broader point and highlight how sort of fundamental a challenge this can be and, and how serious this can be. And especially, I think, in the last year, in 2021, it's something that we've thought a lot about because we thought a lot about vaccines. And one of the most famous cases of scientific misconduct is a study on vaccine and autism that was published by Andrew Wakefield in 1998. It was published by a very fancy and prestigious um, a journal called The Lancet, and it claimed to show, and I really have to under, um, emphasize, it claimed to show a correlation, but it was not, I mean, it really wasn't the case. It was also, also later retracted. Very small data set, 13 small kits or something that, that he'd done some research on. It was retracted because it was false, and a ton of other studies later on have showed that there is no correlation between vaccine and autism. But it's also important to, to, to sort of notice what actually happened in the particular case. So he had personal economic interest in a competing patent that he wanted to make money on. So he wanted sort of a different approach than the existing vaccines back then. So he had a very strong personal financial interest in this. He clearly fabricated data and fudged with results, which led to a distorted message. We'll get back to how this is sort of the definition of scientific misconduct. And this was, of course, something that clearly had a lot of impact on, on science. Researchers have spent extreme amount of resources on sort of rerunning all these studies, showing again and again that there is no correlation. Um, and, and, and here we can see, just sort of briefly, crudely illustrated how the, when the measles vaccine was implemented, we got an extreme strong drop in, in cases as well as death. And this is, of course, not a sort of controlled trials showing the direct effect of Wakefield, but we did have very few cases of, of, of measles this is England and Wales data. And then at some point during the, the zeros and the tens, the number increased quite a bit. Again, there's not a sort of direct cause, causal simple effect from the Wakefield study, but it, it, he has been cited again and again by, by people who don't really understand what's going on here. So this is just sort of to highlight that what the sort of um, fundamental and um, and serious impacts that such scientific misconduct can have. We have to rely on the trustworthy and integrity of research. So I've here provided a couple of examples of, of clear-cut um, um, 
scientific dishonesty cases, a couple of examples where it's not entirely clear, but showing how difficult it is to, to rule out biases. And, 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 and here I sort of began begin the, to, to give the, the definition of what scientific dishonesty involves, but I'll, that, I'll be getting to that in the, in the next video. And then in a live session, there will be a lot more examples and, and, and opportunities to think about, well, how do we actually apply this definition of scientific misconduct that you'll be getting in the next video. Just want to make one final point. Here is a list of people who've had a lot of papers retracted. Um, Staple, we saw just before. Here is a guy who managed to get 183 of his papers retracted for various reasons. One thing one could note, if you look at all the names on this list here, all the first names, Joachim, Diedrich, etc., etc. Uh, some Asian names where I have to admit I'm not entirely sure what gender they have, but I do know that these in the top 32 upon this list, only one is a woman. So apparently this is a male tendency. Maybe it's also because there are more male researchers, of course, but still, just wanted to sort of make that last final anecdote. Next video, getting a, a definition of the, da the Danish definition of uh, scientific misconduct versus the definition used in an American context.